RNZ National. Friday afternoon means Critter of the Week, and I'm joined now by windblown Nicola Tuki from the Department of Conservation. Hi. Hi there. Yeah, we are certainly very uh, cowering at the feet of Tafari Matia this afternoon, I would say, or well, certainly this morning. Boy, is it windy. Yeah, you're only little too. There's a good chance you'll get picked up and uh, carried off into North Canterbury. <laughs> yeah, well, I tell you what, it has been, um, we're quite used to the, the Nor'wester out here. So, you know, not um, sort of 60 k's North Christchurch, um, but this morning was something else. So we have had, I picked up uh, via Niwa, I think, that Waipara has had its official record breaker today, or maybe it's unofficial just yet, 150 kilometre an hour wind oh boy. Uh, up our way today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so far, I've watched, uh, my father-in-law watched a massive, I think it's a big Mac, Mac Papa or a pine go down uh, behind his property. We've been watching big branches off trees, there's trees down in quite a few places and bits of the neighbours shed the roof, don't know where they are. Um, oh boy. So, yeah. It's been, and we've had no power until about half an hour ago. So it's it's quite nice to be able to get the phones charged and um, <laughs> still that uh, we can have. We might even we'll, we'll have a quick lunch. So yeah, to yeah. all everyone out there, I think it's from South Canterbury right through, and it's heading to it'll, you know it's obviously got to Wellington this afternoon as well. She's a, a beauty in terms of that wind. Just reminds us actually of how small we are. Yeah, and are your, two, are your two boys back at school now? No, so that was the start of it. So they were getting ready to go to school, the big boy, the teacher and, and the little boy. <laughs> yeah. And immediately we all got a text saying, no school because trees on road, no buses oh, can wow. get on road. Yeah, no, it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely been a decent dose of Mother Nature in, uh, in the South Island today. So just and, and crazy because they only just got back to school yesterday. So yeah. back to school, out. School's closed. Hey, I imagine there's a, a fair bit of wind on Snares Islands. Yeah, so the Snares Islands are an amazing place. I've been there a couple of times, and today's critter obviously comes from there. So today we're talking about the Snares Island jumping weta, uh, hmm. which is insula, here we go, insulanoplectron spinosum. Uh, one of our many cave water species in New Zealand and endemic to the Snares Island. If you're not familiar with the Snares Islands... I'm not. Um, yeah, well, you need to go there. It's pretty amazing. They, they are about 100 kilometres southwest of Stewart Island. Huh. So if you think you're at the bottom of the world at Stewart Island, you're just yeah, just the jumping off point to the next bottom of the world. And the next bottom <laughs> of the world is just that, that sub-Antarctic. Uh, Archipelago is the wonderful Snares Island. So no introduced animals on the Snares Island. So it's just this incredible, pretty hardy selection of animals living in like real dense shrubby bush, including Snares crested penguins. And I remember when I was lucky enough to go down there many years ago, uh, watching these. So they're they're like a one of those species with the sticky out yellow eyebrows. Yeah. The name crested, <laughs> and watching them kind of on this rock slide where they come in and out of the water which they've obviously done for thousands and thousands of years because you know the the rocks have sort of been almost formed if you like or certainly impacted by the the, the sort of traffic uh the yeah, commute incredible. the daily commute of these penguins so but it's not all penguins and seals and you know the kind of the stuff you <laughs> might expect sub Antarctic. so um there are some invertebrate species down there as well, including this incredible little cave wetter. So in terms of wetter in New Zealand, we've got more than 100 species of wetter. And, and I don't know about you, Jesse, but I kind of feel like there are, you know, defining insect, if you think about it. Yeah, I, th- I think so. And, and I'm so attached to them now that it actually gives me a bit of a surprise when people screw their nose up. Like I kind of, I, I thought everyone had grown to love the wetter, but they still do freak people out. Well, I know that the you know the, the odd person finds one in their gum boot, and that, that's, that's <laughs> kind of often not a pleasant surprise. But they are pretty amazing species, um, or a range of species. These ones um, have sort of stayed under the radar 
for a long time, probably because of their location. Just as an aside, if you are into it, there's a really, and you want to know more about the snares, there was a really great book that came out by Charlotte Randall about seven years ago uh, what called The Bright Side of My Condition, and it's actually based on the true story of four convicts who were marooned on the snares island right at the start of the 19th century. So essentially they were stowaways. They got picked up. Uh, well, they got found. They were kind of escaped a penal colony in Norfolk Island. So they, they stowed away on a sealing ship. And the captain offered to either conscript them into his crew or ditch them off on the snares and come back and get them a year later. Uh, and they opted for being ditched off, but they were there for seven years. So... Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and would have emerged very differently uh, seven years later, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if they ate the little Sneers Island jumping wetter, but uh, they are <laughs> So they, the males and, and females are really only about a, a centimetre and a half long, you know, and very much. And so that's small for a cave wetter, the largest yeah. cave wetter, if you include their antennae, because antennae are longer than the bodies often you know up to four times longer than the bodies of a of the cave wetter the ones in the poor knights islands are 45 centimeters if you include <laughs> you know, a foot and a half <laughs> you wouldn't want to find one of those in your gummy just <laughs> my ship, my feet are too small for one that size to get in my gummy so they were discovered in 1947 and not described until 1970s so it's sort of been off the radar uh, they have a pretty gross defense mechanism. They they eject stinky brown liquid from both ends when they're unhappy. Yeah, so that's, um, it that's, really jumps at jumps out at you from the description of this uh, particular invertebrate, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know, seems to be something we have had a bit of a running theme on invertebrates that you know eject things uh, from their rear, <laughs> but this one does it both ends. So, <laughs> any any uh, uh, ideas on the makeup of this brown gunk that comes squirting out? Well, what I know is that they basically are eating detritus. They're omnivores, and occasionally they're eating each other because as the little juveniles start to um, develop, and so what wetter don't turn into larvae or anything like you know they don't have like a grub stage. They they pop out as tiny wetter, and then they have these sort of molts, which are described as instars. So every time there's a new version of one that's the that's the next instar and so uh they are quite good recyclers though because they actually eat their own malted skin after they emerge from each stage which is not a bad idea because it'll be full of protein (laughs) (laughs) i i know that um so they they come out just after sunset and they kind of start to scuttle back into the the darkness just before sunrise and they're not into light so if you're flicking a torch around they will fling out of the way so that nobody's ever really seen them walking. They just ping like most cave wetter species that you'll be familiar with. Uh, I kn- I saw in the notes uh, when it talked about the excreting and vomiting of brown, musty sm- <laughs> smelling fluid when handled at the same time that it, it also talked about it also defecates frequently when handled. And when I read statements like that, there's just a part of me thinking about that scientist, just a little part of me thinking, how would they figure that out? Like, did they measure, you know, and I've known, and it defecated seven times in the first minute that I handled it. Um, and so that's what we have to thank the scientific community for, because otherwise we would never know. And so they quite like hanging out in seabird burrows, of which there are many, many hundreds of thousands of seabird burrows in the Snares Islands, because you've wow. got, you know, shearwaters and petrels and stuff that essentially fly in at night and then just drop like stones through the bush into and they land they always land within about a foot of their own burrow how they do it that's what they do. Um, we've how, talked about them yeah, before i think yeah yeah they're pretty cool fly through the dark and then, um, but sometimes they don't land because they get hung up in the trees and so you, you often find in places like that like little bird skeletons hanging in the trees they just didn't quite make their it's like when you've got a tricky trying to park in your garage and you've got a tricky entrance onto your property <laughs> a lot worse um, so we know that they are eaten by some of the birds on the island, so little black tomtits, the snares fern bird, there's song thrushes and blackbirds down there, which is crazy. But we know that there's another species of wetter called Zelandrosandrus, 
and they eat these ones as well. Little the the poor old cave jumping cave where they can't eat the other ones back because they're just too tiny. Um, oh. But they probably are eating each other. And and we think cannibalism happens often in the invertebrate world, less often with humans now. Sort of not socially acceptable no. in general. Yes, they st- you um, stop getting invited to parties if you try that sort of thing on. <laughs> That's right. So there's many different kinds of insect cannibalism. I found this quite interesting. So there's infanticide. And, and so just as a, you know, why would they do that? Um, it's thought, it's often when they're in crowded conditions. So they're basically thinning their own population out, right? Oh, to yeah. ensure that there's enough food to go around. So there might be makes, makes sense. Just bad news if you're one of the ones being thinned. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's, you know, it's highly pragmatic, but probably not, you know, there's not a lot of ethics or morals involved. Um, there's sometimes, I particularly like this, and at the end of a long winter, particularly in lockdown, I wouldn't, I don't think I hate the idea of regulated self-cannibalism or autophagy. And what that means is where cells consume part of themselves in order to survive starvation. And the question is, really, you know, is that just mind control weight loss? Could we talk ourselves into it because I would prefer that than, yeah yes well it's been it's been quite a lockdown that's all I can say <laughs> certainly has so um look these are I think they're part of the like I say the defining makeup of you know the picture of our wildlife here in New Zealand yeah. I think it's really you're quite right there's some people that still get the heebie-jeebies about our wetter fauna and so you know this is just a great opportunity to talk about the myriad wetter and all kinds of crazy conditions um, that we have in New Zealand you know right from the Mount Cook flea which is the nickname for the wetter up there which can exist at 3,400 metres down to something that's basically living on the edge of existence in the roaring 40s in the southern ocean Uh, and so you've got to give points to something that uh, has survived and thrived in a place most people would, you know, turn their noses up at. Yeah, it's the only home it knows, eh? How would you rate its uh, physical attractiveness on a scale of 1 to 10? It's a 6 for me, and uh, that's partly due to the beautiful long legs and antennae, but also their high jumping ability, which I, as a kid who genuinely genuinely went under the high jump bar, (laughs) always a little bit in awe of things that can jump. (laughs) <laughs> uh, great Gee, you didn't have to think about that for long Six out of ten Yep, love it Love me a wetter And so should you Great, I do, I do uh, And I love our chats too Nicola Tookie from the Department of Conservation Critter of the Week Catch you next time Thanks, you see Let's uh, hand over to Karen Hay now on the pre-panel Acast powers the world's best podcasts Here's an episode we recommend History This Week, September 11, 2001. Captain Richard Thornton is piloting his ferry boat across New York Harbor when he sees two planes hit the World Trade Center. And that's when we pulled the 180 degree turn and we just headed south to uh, the World Trade Center area. Soon, countless other ferries, tugboats, and pleasure crafts join him. All available boats, this is the United States Coast Guard. Anyone want to help with the evacuation of Lower Manhattan, report to Governor's Island. Find out how this heroic, impromptu rescue mission came together and how Captain Thornton sees it 20 years later on History This Week, available wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST, A-cast, A-cast, A-cast recommends. recommends.